Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of this End Times Prophecy Series, where we are covering what the Bible says about the end times, as well as getting into the book of Revelation and looking at those specific events. We're going to get to the book of Revelation eventually here. Uh, we are right now in the middle of studying Ezekiel. Today in particular, we are looking at Ezekiel 37 through 39, and that's what we have been in. And uh, in fact, it's probably more accurate to to really say instead of Ezekiel 37, it's probably Ezekiel 36. I, I would also encourage you to go back and read most of the book of Ezekiel, if not all of the book of Ezekiel, because there are uh, other events that are happening in there that are leading up to some of the events that we're talking about. There's a little bit more detail. So you can look at some of those things and have some clear understanding of what um, the end times picture is all about. So last week, what we had talked about was Ezekiel 38. That's what we had gotten into. We were covering about half of that. We went back and looked a little bit at Ezekiel 36. Then we jumped forward into Ezekiel 38, and we have seen this timeline of events that have that have really been taking uh, been been taking on. Uh, so these this timeline of events that God has said. First was that he was going to scatter uh, the nation of Israel. And the reason for his scattering of the nation of Israel was because of their defiling um, what it meant to follow God, their defiling of the nation, their defiling of their hearts, their attitudes, their their minds. They had turned their backs on God. They were worshiping false gods. They were involved in very pagan practices and pagan ways. And so God had promised is is that he was going to scatter them because of the way that they were uh that they were defiling that relationship with him. And that would take place ultimately in 70 AD. That's when the Romans came in and essentially destroyed um all of Israel. They they wiped out starting and it really even started before 67. It started in or 70. It started in 67 AD where they came in to the north. They began to attack to the north and they finally got to Jerusalem and destroyed Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD. Um, so the interesting little tidbit on that, when the general came in, uh, the Roman general, he had commanded his troops not to touch the temple, to leave the temple untouched, unhurt, leave it there. They wanted to use the temple and still have it available to them. So he gave specific commands to his troops not to touch the temple. There was a group of the troops that were essentially, um, of, of, Arab descent. They were Middle Eastern descent. It was one of the legions of the Roman troops. That particular legion didn't listen to the command of the general, went in and destroyed the temple. The general was upset about that and said, well, since they've already burned it and destroyed it, go ahead and roll every stone apart from the other, scrape all of the gold off the stones, collect everything that you possibly can. So really, it wasn't the Romans that destroyed the temple. Really, it was this Arab group of, of what would be the uh, foundation of the Muslims that would have been the ones that destroyed uh, this temple. <clears throat> Regardless, it was scattered in 70 AD. Uh, from that point, there would be no Israel. It would not exist whatsoever until uh, the rebirth of Israel that happened in 1948. Uh, in May of 1948, the Israel nation was rebirthed, reborn in one day. And then in 1967, with the Six-Day War, they would take back Jerusalem, and now the capital city would be back under Israel control. So that would happen and complete that cycle. We can also look and see that in in 2017, uh, where President Trump came in and uh, moved the uh, U.S. Embassy into Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, that was also a way of, of making a statement to the world that we are recognizing uh, Israel as a legitimate country and Jerusalem as its capital. Really, prior to that, no country dared recognize or dare even make the statement that we recognize you uh, because of the ramifications around the world. Well, that happened in 2017. Everything was restored. So this was really from 1948 through 2017. This was the period of restoration of the nation of Israel. I, I really think that with that event in 2017, <clears throat> that now the stage is completely set for all of the end times events. Now, that doesn't mean that it actually started in 2018. 
but all of the scenario was now in place. Uh, all of the restoration had happened, and now they were really available to move forward to to what we're going to know as the end time. So now God had warned, uh, and he did this in Ezekiel 36 and 37. In those two chapters, God had warned that the uh, nation not only would be scattered, but that God would gather them. So there would be a great gathering, and the gathering of Israel would be from all countries around the world, from all regions around the world. He would bring people back to the nation that has been restored, the nation that lied in, in this particular time, it lied desolate. It lied really with uh, being destroyed or there was destruction that happened. So during this period of time, there was great desolation over the nation, uh, over the land. It never was what it once was. Um, you know, it was, it never was what it was prior to 70 AD. Uh, and when it was restored, in 1948, all of a sudden now in the desert, it be began to bloom. And this idea of blooming in the desert is the idea of Israel once again being under a blessed situation. God brought this nation back together. Um, he brought it back and there has been technological advances, food advances, agricultural, cultural advances. Um, and and the what was desolate and under destruction has re been rebirthed. It, it has been reborn. Um, and you've seen a tremendous amount of, of blessing and growth happen in that nation. That all fulfills what God said. And God said it not only in Ezekiel 36, but in Ezekiel 37, he said, this is where the, the dry bones will live. In other words, they will come back to life. After this uh, great period of time of desolation and destruction and the land lied uh, unfruitful and unproductive, all of a sudden the dry bones that have been there for a long time are going to come back to life. Now you think about what happened to Israel right before uh, 1948, what happened to the Jewish people, and that would have been the great Holocaust that they were going through because of Nazi Germany. So you look at the events of, of World War II, and you look at <clears throat> what happened under, under Hitler's reign, uh, the atrocities that were committed. This is the ultimate low spot really in the Jewish people, not that they haven't had other low spots, but this was an incredibly low spot. And all of a sudden, out of that pain and misery comes this 1948, this gathering, this dry bones coming back to life. You look at those events in Ezekiel and you just realize God is in control. The things that he has said, he has accomplished. The prophecies that he has he has said would happen have happened, many of them. Now, there are still some left to, to be fulfilled, but that should give you confidence. I personally believe that there are multitudes of reasons to believe why the Bible is true. There's history, there is scientific evidence, there's just looking at the creation of the world, that there has to be an intelligent designer behind all of it, but there's also... In the Old Testament, prophecies that were given and prophecies that have been fulfilled to the letter that then give you confidence that everything else that the Bible says will come true because everything that God has already said that has happened, that's the proof that God is real, that God is true, that God is actively moving. So you can believe the end times events because you have seen the evidence of the fulfillment of the events leading up to this point in time. The one big one, even in Ezekiel, is the fact that this dry bones that live, this is this is the nation of Israel. But he doesn't stop there. He says there will be also a great, This he uses a stick as the analogy. And the stick was, there were two sticks and brought into one. That was the picture of having two kingdoms of Israel now being brought together as one. So in 1948, when Israel was restored, it was one nation, or you can think of it as one kingdom. Now, prior to 70 AD, prior to 70 AD, all the way from around 600 BC, when the Babylonian Empire came in and wiped out Israel and took them captive, from that point, you have not seen Israel ruling itself again. 
So there, Israel has not ruled itself for about 2,600 years, maybe 2,550 years, roughly, since Israel has been self-ruled. They have always been ruled by somebody. It was the the Babylonians, it was the Persians, it was the Greeks, it was the Romans, and then it lied desolate until 1948. Over that period of time, the Ottomans were in control, then the Brit uh, the British were in control up until 1948. Israel has never been self-ruled from that time. You also look at the fact that they haven't been one kingdom since that time, and that was since the time of, of Solomon's son, so since the time of Solomon, his Solomon's father was David, uh, from David to Solomon and Solomon to his sons, um, Rehobo under Rehoboam, um, the land, Rehoboam, the land split or the kingdom split into two. You had, you had Judah and you had Israel and you had those two kingdoms, the two kingdoms, the Judah kingdom, the uh, Israel kingdom. You had both of those kingdoms, but now in the re regathering, there is just one nation. So again, that's God fulfilling prophecy. The dry bones will live. What lie desolate will come back to life. It will be great blooming in the desert that will happen. It won't be two kingdoms anymore. It will just be one nation, one kingdom uh, under Israel. So let's get back into chapter 38. Let me quickly read through it again, just so that we can re uh, regather ourselves to what was happening last time, because these are important events that are going on uh, in the bringing back of Israel, but not just that, what's going to happen in the end times. These are future events that are yet to be fulfilled. So let's look at that together and then get into the rest of chapter 38. We'll get through all of chapter 38 here today. So we started it off this way. The word of the Lord, the word of Adonai came to me. Now, who who is the me? Well, that is to uh, Ezekiel. So it says that the word of the Lord came to, um, it came to Ezekiel. So, and he's the one writing this. So the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, came to me saying, son of man, set your face toward Gog, toward Gog. That is, that is a name. That's almost a, uh, a title toward the ruler of the land of Magog. So this is one land. So if you look at the lands that God is picking out, he's going to say the land of Magog. Chief prince of Meshach, that's another land, and Tubal, that's a that's a third land. Prophesy against them and say, thus says Adonai Elohim, the Lord Almighty, the Lord Supreme, the Lord All-Powerful, Behold, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And what I'm going to do, God says, is I'm going to turn you about and I'm going to put hooks in your jaws. So God is God is at the reins of all of the end times events. God is going to turn them toward, toward his land, toward his people, Israel. He says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaws and I'm going to bring you out with all your army I'm going to bring your army against my people. All of them are going to be splendidly dressed, a vast assembly with a breastplate and a shield, all of them wielding swords. With them will be these other lands, Persia, Cush, and Put, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his troops, the house of Togarma. That's another land that it's going to, going to reference, to the land of Togar, Togarma, from the extreme north and all his troops and many peoples with you. So this is the warning. God says these are the people that are going to come against Israel in the last days. Now we don't know any of those lands because those are ancient references of regions. But if you overlay the ancient uh, regions where these would have been at, you can see what the lands are today, the countries are today, that will be coming against Israel. So look at this. So we looked at and we saw that we we find where these lands are. So first of all, you have Magog. Now these, again, as I said last time, these are the Stan. Uh, these are the Stan nations. And that, those are uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Stan nations. You'll also have Meshach. Now Meshach and also uh, Tubal, also, uh, also Gomer 
and Beth Togarma. Beth Togarma. Uh, Beth just means house of. That's that's what a reference is. Some of your versions will say that. Some leave out the Beth, but all of these are what are modern day Turkey. So these are all Turkey. So that's one region. Now, Turkey is going to be a major player. Turkey was the home of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and there is a movement afoot a, a right now to try to have a restored Ottoman Empire. There's a real desire. In fact, we're coming up almost on the 100th year of the, uh, of the nation leaving Ottoman control and becoming what we know as secular Turkey today. There is a movement to get them back to the Ottoman Empire. They believe that the Ottoman Empire is restored and returns, that there will be a leader, the, the caliph or the caliph, that will be the head of the Muslim people that will then rule this great empire. That's most likely who the Antichrist is going to be, the person who is the great leader of the Muslim empire. By the way, that fulfills Muslim prophecy. Uh, and, and we'll look and see about that later because Muslim po prophecy parallels biblical prophecy when it comes to their, their Messiah is what the Bible talks about as the Antichrist. And so we're going to look at that and see about that later. Then you have the countries of Persia, which is Iran. You have the countries of Kush, which is Sudan and Ethiopia, so it's these African nations. And then you have the countries of Put, which is Libya, uh, which is Algeria, and you look at these nations, so these African nations. So if you look at it, uh, if we were just to play all of this out, you have Israel, and Israel is being attacked from all directions. So these directions are coming against Israel. Now, you could say, well, hasn't, hasn't this happened? Israel has been attacked before, but they have been attacked before, but never about uh, by this version of the nations. Now, all of these are a Muslim confederacy. This is a, a, a Muslim coalition of nations. And it's not going to be an, a European Union like people have taught for years. That's not what it's going to be. The European Union may not like Israel, but they don't have a bloodlust against Israel. Who in the world has bloodlust hatred against Israel more than anybody else wanting to wipe them off the face of the map? Well, it's the Muslim Coalition of Nations. Those are the ones that want to see Israel destroyed. Now, you also have a potential, and we don't know for sure, but you have a potential of the nation called Rosh. In the King James Version and in the New King James Version, in chapter 38, verse 2, it references the prince of Rosh. Now, what is Rosh? Well, Rosh is modern-day Russia. It's not in some translations it is in other translations you, you may ask well what is the difference well the king james version and the new king james version as has as their source materials for their translations of the bible a different source material than the other versions of the bible now i don't want to get into all of that because it's it's a long discussion to get into um, there are very minor differences between the two really source materials. There's not major, there's just a few little minor. And this is one of those kind of minor things that it says in our the version I just read, it says the prince of Meshach and Tubal. Uh, it adds in that one, the prince of Rosh. So you may see that noted if you read the King James or the New King James Version. So let me just throw that in there. It could possibly be a Russian uh, and Muslim coalition force that is coming against Israel. So Russia may or may not be involved. We don't really know, but we do know that we have places Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Beth Togmara, or Togarma, uh, Persia, modern day Iran, Kush, and Put. We do know those for sure because those match up. No matter what translation you're reading, those are all a part of it. So look at this. This is all coming against the nation of Israel today. They are attacking from every direction, from the north, from the south, from the east, and from the west. A, a coalition of forces coming against God's people or God's holy land. Well, let's keep going and just again remind ourselves what we looked at last time. 
So he says, be prepared, uh, prepare yourself, you and your company. Now, who is the you? Again, this is the this is the Antichrist. This is Gog of Magog. This is who he's talking to, the Prince of Meshach, the Prince, maybe the Prince of Rosh, uh, but that's who he's talking to. So be prepared, prepare yourself, you and your company gathered around you. Be a guard for them. After many days, you, you're going to be summoned. So God is going to say, after the certain amount of time, I'm going to put this into effect. I'm going to make this happen. You may kind of bristle against that. How could God do this? Well, God has a history in the Bible of doing this. He brought Babylon against Israel when Israel was defiling. Just read the prophet Jeremiah, and you're going to see the picture of what's going to happen. He has brought lands against his nation when his nation is is sick and and idolatrous and full of uh, falsehood and defilement. Uh, he will bring them against them. He brings people against for his purposes to accomplish his purposes. So he says to the Antichrist, to Gog, after many days, you will be summoned. And when is this going to happen? This will happen in the latter years. So this is going to happen after the end times, in the end times, in the end times events. It's not happening in the time of Ezekiel. It did not happen in the time of of, uh, of when Jesus was there. It did not happen for any of those periods of time. It has not happened yet. You've never seen this coalition of nations come against a reborn Israel. It will happen in the latter years, in the end days. In the end days, you again who is who is that you well that you is going to be the uh the uh the antichrist gog of magog that's the you that's going to happen you're going to come against the land that has been what it has been brought back from the sword it has been regathered that's what you're going to do you're going to come against the regathered land the people who've been regathered from the mountains of Israel, that it was a continual wasteland. Remember, it was desolate and destroyed. It was a continual wasteland. God brought them, uh, God restored them. You're going to come against them, Antichrist, Gog of Magog, you and your forces in the end days. You're going to come against them when they are dwelling securely. When Israel has a sense that they are finally dwelling securely. What would that mean? Well, probably some kind of a some kind of a covenant. Uh, some kind of a covenant is made so that they feel like they are secure. When that covenant is made and they feel secure, that's when you're going to come up against them. You will come against them like a storm. You're going to be like a cloud covering the land. You and your troops and many people with you. So it's when when Israel is dwelling securely and safely. Thus says Adonai Elohim, uh, Elohim, the supreme God, the creator God, the all-powerful God. So Adonai is Lord. Thus says the Lord supreme, the one in control, the creator God. It will come to pass in that day that things will come in your heart. Now, what does that mean that things are going to come in your in your heart? Who's the your? Well, again, that's the Antichrist. It's the Gog of Magog. Things are going to come into the Antichrist's heart. You're going to devise an evil plan. You're going to say, I'm going to go up against the land of unwalled villages. Now, that is Israel feeling secure. I will fall upon the quiet people, Israel feeling secure, who live securely. Israel's going to feel secure. All of them living without walls. That's security. Having no bars or gates. That's security. So, when Israel has a sense of security. And most likely, again, that's a covenant where the Antichrist is going to say, we will let you live in peace. We're not going to attack you. We won't, we're not going to harm you. When that happens and they let their guard down, then this evil plan, you will come against them in order to seize spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places now inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have been acquiring livestock and property, property, who live in the center of the world. Now, I just want you to note this, <clears throat> and I didn't mention this last time, but this is an important little concept. God says these are the people that live in the center of the world. Israel, in particular Jerusalem, is the center of the world for God's purposes. It's God's center. These people have been regathered 
from the nations. We, we know that, 1948, 1967, they got Jerusalem. They have been gathered from the nations. When they got back to what was the waste places, they have helped, they, they have worked it. They have seen it blossom. They have seen it grow up so much so that now they have plunder. Now they have livestock and property and you're going to come against them this is going to be your evil plan. So when the last days happen, Israel is going to be attacked by a nation of coalition forces that are bent on Israel's destruction. They want Israel wiped out. Who are those people that want Israel wiped out? It is this Muslim coalition of nations. This Muslim coalition will be uh, led by somebody referred to as Gog, also known as the Antichrist. And in the end times, there's going to be something that enters into the mind and the heart of Gog, of Antichrist, that is going to say, let's make an agreement with them, let's turn our backs on them and break the agreement as soon as they let their guard down and they feel at peace. Maybe Israel says, we don't need our missile defense system anymore, so we're not going to put money into it. They have let their guard down. They don't worry about it anymore because everything feels peaceful. Maybe they've put their uh, troops on uh, on leave or furlough or they're not drafting in or requiring service into the Israeli army anymore. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but there's going to be some kind of an agreement, a peace agreement, a peace accord, or a peace covenant where they will let their guard down. And as soon as they do, Antichrist, Gog, with the other nations that will join that will be coming against Israel for its destruction. So this is where I left off last time, and this is where, where we're going to really pick up and go more in depth today. Uh, there will be a group of other nations who will see what Gog, what Antichrist is doing uh, in the nations that are going to be coming against Israel. When they see this happening, they're going to say, what are you doing? Uh, you, you need to stop this. Let's come to the negotiation table. Let's try to figure this out. Or are you going to come against us as well? Uh, those are the nations of Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish with all of its young lions. And they're going to say to the Antichrist, to Gog, have you come to see spoil? Have you assembled your company to plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and property, to make off with immense spoils? Essentially, what they're trying to do is they're going to say, let's come to the, the negotiation table, which the Antichrist will have nothing to do with negotiations. But these are the nations that think that diplomacy is the means by which we can make we can get through let's can we just appease them can we give them money can we have a diplomatic outcome to this event can we just negotiate with them none of that is going to work because the antichrist gog of magog will not listen to any of it so what are these nations well you have sheba sheba is what is called the gulf states sheba in the gulf states would have been the countries of yemen of bahrain of qatar um, those would be the, uh, the UAE would be a part of the Gulf states. So those are the Gulf states. That's Sheba. Sheba is the Gulf states. Then you have the nation of Dedan. Now, what is Dedan? Well, that is Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia will also be a part of that. Let's negotiate. Let's try to, uh, let's try to fix this without, uh, without bloodshed. Let's just try to have diplomacy. So the Gulf states, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, uh, Yemen, Bahrain, um, Oman, uh, Kuwait possibly, uh, along with Saudi Arabia. And then you have these other groups, which is going to be called Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is most commonly thought of to be the British uh, Empire, or you can think of it as the UK. The UK, so what are, you know, think of what the British Empire used to be and think of how Tarshish gave birth, essentially, to a bunch of young lions. What are the young lions? Well, that would have been the US, that would have been Canada, that would have been uh, Australia. Uh, you could throw in there, uh, New Zealand would be part of that. Um, even possibly India is going to be a part of that because that would have been a British stronghold. So these countries of the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, maybe even some of the uh, 
the outlying uh, island type of nations that uh, that the UK once held. So look look at this. You have the UK. US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, along with Saudi Arabia, along with the Gulf states of uh, Bahrain, UAE, uh, you have Kuwait possibly, you have uh, Qatar, you have uh, Bahrain, Bahrain, you have the Oman. So these nations, UAE, Bahrain, Kuwait, um, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, they will they will stand up kind of against the Antichrist. They won't fall in line with the Antichrist with the these nations. They will stand up against that, but they will only stand up with weakness. They won't stand up with power. It'll be weak. It will be through a, a means of diplomacy. Uh, the U.S. is weak anymore. We have we, we are not a strong power in, in the world anymore, and so when we come up against them, um, you're not going to see a lot of uh, you're not going to see a lot of power behind it. It's more going to be can we just negotiate and have diplomacy to try to fix this this problem. What's interesting is you have these countries like the UAE, um, like um, the like Bahrain. Uh, along with uh, Sudan, Morocco, uh, possibly even Saudi Arabia, that these are the nations that are right now wrestling with or joining, having joined uh, what's called the Abraham Accords, and that is this peace agreement. So don't be surprised if Saudi Arabia actually signs, and then maybe you have Kuwait, Oman, Qatar. We already know that these nations are they're they're for Israel. They're not. Uh, they some anti-Israel statements have been made, but for the most part, these countries have all stood with Israel to a certain extent. Well, that's where the United States even falls into the whole end times prophecy events, is that it happens right here in this little bitty reference to the young lions. Now, people often ask, well, where is the United States in this? I believe what's going to happen to the United States, and this is just my personal opinion, is that the United States will probably have internal strife, and the United States will, because of the the crazy wokeness that is in the United States now, the internal strife that is in there now, um, we are we are basically impotent when it comes to the world stage with power. I, I really think that what's going to happen in the United States is we are just going to become a very powerless nation, which is not what I want to see. It's not what I want to hear. It's not what I hope will happen. It's just what my prediction of what will happen will be, is that we will become very powerless, impotent with internal strife and internal conflicts, tearing ourselves apart with the idea of trying to become more and more woke. We are trying to become more and more uh, more and more uh, basically powerless when it comes to what we stand for. And so as we become more and more like that, we will just have less and less impact upon the world stage. So when it comes to all of these things happening, think about the Antichrist, the empire of the Antichrist and the power that is going to be behind that, if you look at all of those nations, you look at possibly Russia being there, that would be by far the largest army in the world. Uh, that it would, it would not even be comparable if you add Russia into the mix. There's a lot of... Uh, a, a lot of weaponry. There's nuclear arsenals that could happen, and we have just, uh, we have just, as a country, by leaving all of our military, uh, you know, goods, our military uh, equipment and weaponry, we have just really helped this empire to be established. We have, we have just aided that event, and not only that, we're giving money like crazy to these countries, helping them to establish even more. So if you look at the beastly empire. And what that will be comprised of and what the power of this beastly empire will be and the size of the army, we, because of our impotence, our wokeness, our internal strife, um, we and the Tarshish and all of the young lions will not have nearly the capacity to ever come against, and we don't have the stomach to. We don't have the guts to. So we will try to come to the negotiation table, the di diplomatic route, and say, our, what, what are you doing? Can we can we help you? Can we give you money? Can you just stop doing this? Would you just play nice? And uh, the, the 
beastly system, the Antichrist is not going to respond to any of that at all. Verse 14 in chapter 38. Therefore, son of man, and again, who's who's that is he talking about? Well, now he has moved back to Ezekiel. Therefore, Ezekiel, prophesy to Gog, that's the Antichrist. When you're prophesying, you're saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to do, Gog, Antichrist. Thus says the Lord, Adonai, the Lord, Elohim. Elohim is, is the creator. Elohim is the all-powerful. Elohim is the supreme. Therefore, Ezekiel prophesied to the Antichrist, saying that the Lord supreme, the Lord the creator, the Lord who is the all-powerful. In that day, when, when my people Israel dwell safely, again, they're, they're dwelling in safely, will you not know? You, Gog, Antichrist, will come from your palace out of the extreme north. So there's a palace that is out of the extreme north. Now, in the day of Ezekiel, the extreme north could have meant one of two things. We could be thinking of the extreme north as really just Turkey, because that is where the extreme north is. Now, I, that's what I personally think is going to happen. It's going to be out of Turkey. It could also be out of Russia. That would also be the extreme north. But in the day of Ezekiel, Russia wasn't even really much of a thought. It was Rosh, but it wasn't much on the radar of them. But the extreme north of Turkey would have been. Now, why do I think that that is the case? Well, Turkey, like I mentioned before, was the the really the home of what was the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire fits with the picture in the book of Daniel. In Daniel, it talks about the uh, statue image that King Nebuchadnezzar saw that Daniel, um, that Daniel was able to interpret. The final part of the statue will be both, um, it will be both, uh, what was it? It was both iron uh, and clay is what it was. It will be an empire that was made up of of some people that want that agree and some people that don't agree. Uh, it, the Ottoman Empire is going to be made up of Muslims who are fully committed, and it's going to be made up of people who don't want anything to do with it. That's the iron and the clay mixing. In the Book of Revelation, it says that it was a beast that was really it was dead. And it has come back to life. Well, in Turkey, there is a desire for the Ottoman Empire to be restored. The Ottoman Empire went away and it became the nation of Turkey. Now the leaders of the nation of Turkey want to restore the old Ottoman Empire. I believe that that's going to fit the picture of what the beastly empire is going to be. So I would not be surprised that the Antichrist will come from his place out of the extreme north, meaning the extreme north of Turkey, meaning a revived Ottoman Empire, bent on destroying the nation of Israel. It's not coming him coming by himself. He will come. This is the, again, this is Gog. This is Antichrist. He will come with many peoples with you. You're going you're gonna to have a big army with you. All of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now, why does it say riding on horses and not say riding on tanks, riding on um, military equipment, riding on helicopters, uh, jets? Why doesn't it say that? Because they would have no idea in the day of Ezekiel what any of that would have meant. In fact, prior to really about uh, the World War II time, they would have had no clue, or well, really World War I, they would have had no clue what tanks, what uh, arm, what what uh, planes would have been, really until Vietnam there was no. Well, I guess in in um, in the uh, Korean War they started using helicopters. So really, between the time of Ezekiel and about 19 um, anywhere from 1920 and on, they would have had no idea what any of that equipment would have been. So it just says they're going to come riding on horses, meaning that they're going to come with a mighty army with power. You. Antichrist will come up against my people. 
That's a clear indication of Israel. You're going to come up against Israel like a cloud covering the land. So you will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud covering the land. In, in other words, you're going to envelop the land. You're going to cover the land. It's going to be a vast army. When we see this happen, it will be a massive army that will be coming against Israel, and we will see all of this forming before this attack actually happens, because we will see the Middle East exploding, and it's on it's teetering right now on the edge of exploding into, into this empire really being able to be created. Now, God gives the indication, and he says exactly when this is going to happen. It will happen in the last days we know it has not happened yet because we are still wondering if it is the last days when you see these events happening and you see israel being surrounded and attacked from every direction when you see this happen then you will know that we are in the what he says we are in the last days that is Matthew 24. That is going to be the book of Daniel. You're going to look at that book of Revelation. You're going to look at Ezekiel again, and you're going to realize that all of these have been indications and pictures of what the last days will be. It will all happen in the last days. I will bring you. So who is, who is the you? Well, we've been talking about, that's the Antichrist. I will bring you Antichrist, Gog of Magog. I'm going to bring you against my land. So God is the one doing this. God in his sovereignty and in his control is bringing these events to pass. God is leading toward the end times. He is not a bystander. He is intimately involved in bringing this nation, this empire against Israel. Why would he do that? Well, he gives us the one reason. So that the nations may know me. This will be, this will be a, a, a wonderful opportunity for the nations to know me. They will know me in these days. What will happen, I believe, out of this, because it matches up with what Matthew says, is there will be a great revival and there will be a great coming to faith by a multitude of people in the nation of Israel and around the world when we see these last days events. When you start showing people that these are the events that are going to happen, that God spoke about them, uh, you know, about uh, 2,600 years ago, and now they are coming to pass, this will be a great faith builder for people. They will know me when I am sanctified. Now, what does the word sanctified mean? The word sanctified means set apart. When God is declared holy, when God is declared holy and set apart, when they, when everybody sees this happen, they will know God and he will be set apart through you, Gog, before their eyes. So what's going to happen? God is using these events. He's using antichrist he's using gog to make sure that people really come to know him god is ultimately in control and he is going to bring this end times battle so that people will know that he is who he says he is now there is another side note i want you just to kind of keep your radar tuned into and that is that is the question of which battle is this that is being talked about is this the armageddon battle is this the revelation i believe it's 20 or 21 battle which battle is this there are some theologians and we're going to talk about this next time that believe that this battle is just one of three battles that are being really talked about in the end times the final event, the final one that comes at the end of Revelation is the time where Satan is finally destroyed. And then we go into the what's called the New Jerusalem and New, uh, New Earth. That will happen at the end. That's the third battle. The second battle is the return of Christ, the return of, of Jesus. This one is either 
a different battle, a pre-battle, which is going to cause great revival, or this is the return of Jesus battle. And there's reasons why we're not quite sure because of how that it plays out as we'll go into uh, next time uh, as we look at a little bit further verses in the book of Ezekiel. But with that said, let's keep going. We know that there is this is either the return of Jesus or this is another battle in the end times, in the final seven years, that will lead to the return of Jesus. We, we're just not quite sure, and we'll look at that together um, uh, next time. But let's keep going. Verses 17 through 19. Thus says Adonai Elohim. Again, what is, what is Adonai Elohim? Well, El Elohim is just the... Uh, the Lord Supreme, the Lord, uh, the Lord Creator, uh, All Powerful, um, the uh, the you know Ruler, um, the Ultimate. It, that's thus says the the Lord Supreme, the Lord Creator, the Lord All Powerful. Are you the one? So are you again? That's Antichrist Gog. Are are you Antichrist, the one I spoke about in former times? So what does that mean? That means that God has also prophesied about the Antichrist in other books through my servants, the prophets of Israel. In other words, you don't have to just look at Ezekiel. There are other references to what's going to happen in other books of the Bible. Are you the one that I spoke about through my servants of Israel who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them? And the answer is, it's kind of a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. So what is God saying? He is saying, I have, I have prophesied. So I have, I have prophesied about, um, about the Antichrist, not just in Ezekiel, but all throughout the Old Testament. There are other references, other references to it. There are in, in Daniel, in the book of Jeremiah. There's references in uh, in Deuteronomy. There's references in the Psalms. There's references here in Ezekiel, uh, amongst many others that talk about the end times. There, this is just uh, you know five of many that are referenced. So God has been speaking and prophesying. We need to tune our ears into the prophetic statements of God when it comes to the end times events. Understanding prophecy is very, very important when you are trying to understand exactly what is going to happen. And God has made it very clear. We're just not in tune with it, and we haven't paid attention to what God has said exactly will happen. Now, we're not trying to pick obscure things and make them mean something that is not really being said. We're just looking at what the Bible says and taking that for face value. So God has said, in that day, when Gog, when Antichrist comes against the land of Israel... By the way, it's declaration of Adonai, meaning this is a promise. It's it's a guarantee. This, these events uh, are going to uh, these events are going to happen. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. God has made a promise. He has made a declaration. This is going to happen. In those days, he says that my fury will rise up. Uh, so my fury will rise up in my nostrils. So God is getting angry, and finally he can't take it anymore. God is slow to anger. He is abounding in loving kindness. He has given us ample opportunity, but there will be a time that the opportunity is going to run out. When the opportunity runs out, the wrath of God will be poured out. The wrath is going to come. So there is a point that he has he has uh the the fury has just risen to the top and it's no longer what i'm going to allow anymore he says in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath i have spoken surely in that day there will be a great earthquake in the land of israel now is this great earthquake a literal or is this a figurative and the answer to that is uh, yes, maybe literal, maybe figurative, probably both. That's really the answer. There's going to be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. What's the figurative earthquake? Well, this massive beastly empire coming against Israel will be a great earthquake in the land. There will be a rumbling in the land. There will be a battle in the land. It will be a devastation in the land. 
the literal earthquake could be just that, a literal earthquake. And there are references to the in the Bible about a literal earthquake where the hill is split in two, where the land moves in Jerusalem. So a literal earthquake, and that could be another sign that we are going to see that happen in the midst of all of this chaos and all of these events. The fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep upon the ground, and all humans will, uh, upon the face of the earth will shake at my presence. And this is the knowing of God. You will know me. You will know that I am real. You will know that I am Adonai Elohim, that I am the creator, the God supreme, the uh, the the one who has the authority and control. All earth will shake at my presence. The mountains will be thrown down. The steep places will fall every wall will fall to the ground so again this is the this is both the it could be both the literal and the figurative now what is the literal that is just the literal there is an earthquake and things just crumble and that's very real very very likely possibility the figurative earthquake will be this coming this coming campaign this coming beastly empire against israel that's going to shake them to the core that is going to bring destruction and devastation on the land and that could very likely be the case as well so it's probably both a literal and a figurative earthquake and shaking that will happen but nevertheless all will know god they will see God, whether they accept him or not, whether they bow their knees to him or not is another story, but they will all know God. I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. It is a declaration. Anytime you see that, you can just take it as God's word. It is a promise. It's a guarantee. It's going to happen. I am saying this is going to happen. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So the great shaking that will happen, all of this earthquake that will happen the sword will that, that will come as the final battle against uh the antichrist so all of this in this antichrist will be a final destruction not only against israel by the antichrist but there will be a destruction of the antichrist empire by god that God will bring ultimate vengeance and destruction and people will know that it is God. So think about how that could happen. When God intervenes, his intervening, uh, when he intervenes in Israel, there will be no explanation other than it's God that did this. It is God that moved. We were destroyed. There was massive amounts of chaos and destruction that came against us, this massive earthquake that will and think about the massive earthquake that will have an attack of destruction on the Antichrist empire, and then the confusion of every man's sword being against his brother. So think about this in the chaos and in the heat of battle that they all start turning on one another because they don't know where the enemy is coming from. They don't know what's going on and they turn on each other. So God will have the ultimate say and the ultimate conclusion in all of this battle. He says, I will punish him. So, so again, who's the him? That's Antichrist and Gog that God is referencing because that's the one who's been at the center of this entire chapter, the center of this entire story. I'm going to punish him with pestilence and with blood. So what is pestilence? That is disease. Uh, that is uh, pandemic. That is maybe some massive amount of virus. And blood could be both literal, uh, it could be sword against sword, it could be, um, it could be you know, uh, military conflict, that could be what's happening, or it could be just death and blood from the disease, pandemics, and vi virus that is the pestilence. He says, I'm going to pour out rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples with him, a torrential rain. I'm going to pour out hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So what, what is happening? Well, if you look at the timeline of events, and let's just wrap up all of this with this timeline. That's a crazy looking line, but whatever. Um, Israel's restored. Israel's regathered. Israel has peace. And so you could throw in here, uh, Jerusalem comes back, 1967. So, so we could say 1948, 1967. We could say uh, the 2017 events of 
the U.S. moving their embassy there. We know that you can throw in there a rebuilding of the temple. There would be the third temple that is rebuilt. There's a time of peace where Israel feels at peace. And then when they feel at peace, when a covenant has been made, all of a sudden there will be the Antichrist Gog will attack Israel. When that happens, as they attack Israel, many of much of Israel will be destroyed. There will be chaos. People will be driven away. It will be just pure, um, pure insanity of what's going on. But then God will intervene. And as God intervenes, what is he going to do? Well, he is going to destroy this empire. How is he going to do it? With pestilence, with blood with hailstones, fire, and brimstone, a torrential rain, that's going to bring destruction, a rain of power that will destroy this empire as God intervenes. And then what is the end result of God intervening? Now, this could be also the return of Jesus, or this is a separate battle that is going on. Again, we'll look at that next time and get an idea of what's being said. But here's what's going to know. I will magnify and I will set apart myself. I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations and they will know that I am Adonai. So what's going to happen in this event is people will know Adonai Elohim. They will know the Lord Supreme, the Lord Almighty, the Lord who is the creator. They will know God. All nations, all peoples, will know God. At that time, is it too late for them? Will they bend their knees to him? Will they have rejected him and cannot come back from that stage? We'll talk about that as we keep going forward next time. But in the end, through all of these events, people will know God. They will know Adonai Elohim. They will see him magnified, sanctified, and set apart for his purposes. Well, that's all I have for you today. That is the end of chapter 38. Thank you for joining with me and sitting with me through this entire chapter. Next time we will get into chapter 39 and then we were going to go forward to the book of Revelation. To understand Revelation, you have to understand the book of Daniel. You have to understand the book of Ezekiel. You have to understand what Matthew talks about when Jesus speaks, uh, uh, when he's speaking from uh, to his disciples in Matthew 24, uh, you need to understand those. When you understand those, it will make revelation make sense. So if you have not watched our previous videos, please go back and watch the previous ones covering Ezekiel and covering Daniel, and go back and watch the sermon series called Endgame that covers Matthew chapter 24. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you back here next week as we get into Ezekiel chapter 39. See you then.